Uh, the best part, hey everybody, uh, across all my social platforms and the new Vayner Commerce uh, platforms, I'm Gary Vaynerchuk. I will uh, introduce the uh, wonderfully attractive Robbie Deeks, Ben Fried, and Zubin M. Uh, shortly, however, the best part of this before we get into uh, coffee and commerce, which is what we're calling this uh, real this week or two that I'm going to be doing original uh, cre- uh, content for my podcast and my live platforms. Uh, around this incredibly exciting launch of Vayner Commerce, which we'll get to in a second. But by far the best thing was we were just about to go live and uh, and I was on with Dustin, who also produces Tea with Gary Vee with me. And he said, uh, I'm not gonna, uh, you know, when we, I said, are we going live? He goes, yeah, we're about to go live. He's like, I'm not sure how you're gonna know it's going live, um, but just start in 10 seconds. And then about eight seconds in, the top left corner of my screen went from scheduled to live. So Dustin, I don't know if you can jump in here and say hello, because I know a lot of people from TV with Gary Vee you. <laughs> Dustin, that was the way I was gonna know it was live. The thing in the top left corner. <laughs> I've never been on the other side, so I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Understood. It's a right. pretty good indicator. Right. Yeah. Get back to your side, Dustin. Okay, bye. All right, love you. <laughs> anyway, uh, hello everybody. I see a lot of the comments coming through, just like I do with T with Gary Vee, so this makes it even more fun for everybody who's listening. Uh, uh, as a podcast, uh, whether we're doing that tomorrow or a couple days later, thank you. This is a very special day in the history of VaynerX. VaynerX, if you don't know, is the holding company uh, that houses all these companies that I'm building in the Vayner empire, uh, as I like to call it in my own head, but the Vayner uh, conglomerate of businesses, which starts with Vayner Media a decade ago, um, and then and then kind of grew from a scenario of the acquisition we made of PureWow.com, which started a publishing side, which we call the Gallery Media Group, which holds homes and houses all those publishing sides, and then just an explosion of like business intelligence, SaaS product, Tracer.tech, uh, the Sasha Group.com, our small business uh, complement, um, our uh, uh, our speaking bureau, Vayner Speakers, and on and on and on, and we add another sister brother to the equation today officially something that I will let Robbie tell the origin story of a little bit uh, about Vayner Commerce. Uh, and before before we get into that, big shout out to Sabir, uh, an early executive at Vayner Media who started the initial um, Vayner Commerce capability inside of Vayner Media before we've taken it out. So before I went any further, I want to give you a big shout out, Sabir. I hope you're watching or you hear this. Uh, you were an enormously important part of this journey along with many other employees. And so uh, why don't we introduce ourselves? Robbie, why don't you start? Yeah, so I'm Robbie Deeks, uh, Chief Commercial Officer at Vayner Commerce. Uh, I've been with Vayner now for about two years, um, building towards you know this day, and uh, previously came from uh, Shopify Plus, uh, where I worked for two years on the enterprise side. Very nice, Ben. Hey guys, uh, Ben Fried. I'm the CTO at Vayner Commerce. Um, you want the life story? Or you want the 30 second version? I'll take the 63 <laughs> second version. Though. 63 seconds. Yes, All right. Uh, I've been into computers and technology my entire life. Um, kind of started building computers when I was 10, messing around with the internet when it kind of first came about. Um, and ultimately started a business when I was 13, building uh, websites and, uh, and an e commerce business selling custom built computers, which I'm sure. As Gary can attest to, if you're doing e-com in the 90s, everyone thought you were a maniac. Um, maniac. I think they still think I'm a maniac, so that's fine. I'll, I'll, okay. I earned the title. Um, so, yeah, since then, um, I kind of built a video streaming uh, news network platform in the kind of early 2000s, uh, catering to car enthusiasts. Uh, again, kind of with that early theme of streaming HD videos, right, when people first had HD TVs in, like, 2002. So that was uh, also a little early. Um, and kind of spent my 20s um, bouncing around in the kind of tech startup world, built a social shopping platform and um, some other interesting platforms like that. And then seven years ago, met Zubin, came to Lucid Fusion. We could spend four hours talking about all the stuff we've done over the last seven years, but let's just say it, it has culminated into today, which is the launch of Vayner Commerce. Fantastic. Zubin, want to pick that up? Absolutely, great to be with all of you. Uh, Zubin Malavi, now president of Vayner Commerce, previously CEO of Lucid Fusion. So for 20 years, as Ben mentioned, prior to Ben joining, uh, we kind of did uh, everything in terms of web development, app development, et cetera, for kind of any, all kinds of companies. And then seven years ago decided, hey, we need to bring in, uh, bolster our team, vis-a-vis Ben and the rest of the team, and then really focus on one area, decided to focus on e-commerce, decided to, partnered with Shopify Plus and jump on that bandwagon early. Um, and then I'll let Robbie, as Gary mentioned, tell you the origin story of how the three of us met and everything transformed from there. Fantastic. Well, 
you know, since we are live, and uh, I'm gonna incorporate some comments, Mika Ellis says, I totally admire what Gary has achieved. He is such an aspiring person. Nevertheless, I can't help, whenever he speaks, I get stressed. So it's a funny, <laughs> fun start. Mika, I'm sorry, I don't wanna stress you. I actually think it's super, you know, I might be high energy and intense, but I actually think it's patience and, and slow it down and, and optimism. So hopefully, Mika, you'll hear some things here that do not stress you. So let's get right into this. Uh, you know, how did this all happen? You know, why don't we start with this? You know, Robbie, why don't you tell the story of the first time we met um, and, and what you thought? I know it's a very fun circumstance. I know the length is interesting. Let's just play it out. Tell us the story of that. I think it's a re, you know, it's one of the seeds. At that point, Sabir had been at Vayner. We were starting to do some e-commerce. For anybody who doesn't know, Vayner Commerce, actually, Zubin, Robbie, how would you describe what Vayner Commerce does? Let's start there and then we'll go to the origin story. Yeah, so Vayner Commerce is a uh, full funnel uh, growth engineering firm. So we're focused on the entire funnel, acquisition, conversion, retention, et cetera, across retail, across online, and helping brands basically navigate that path and find sustainable growth across that. Whether it's creative, it's media, it's technology, data sciences, really connecting everything and bolstering it. Robbie? Uh, I, I think I think Zubin covered it pretty well, but <laughs> uh, in right. terms of in terms of uh, I guess to connect what Zubin just mentioned and the first meeting though. Um, Actually, before we go there, let me let me turn what Zubin just said into English that normal people can understand. Thank so, you. So Vayner Commerce builds commerce sites for people that want to sell things, makes them better when somebody else built them if they're all fucked up. And also, and most importantly, we've lived through a huge era where people have used Facebook and Instagram and other media outlets to get customers to your website and then they buy something and you've got a business. The problem is most people don't have their economics right. They don't realize how much money they're losing on shipping. They don't think about packaging and messaging on the shipping. They don't realize that 4,000 landing pages is better than one if their ads match up and they have the ability to produce that much content and creativity. Even on the ads and content, they don't realize that a lot of variations of creative will drive down your CAC, customer acquisition cost. We've assessed the space for a long time. Ben and I have been in, uh, zoom in at some level. All of us have pretty much been in our entire careers because even since I've been running Vayner, I've always got one big eye on winelibrary.com. Email marketing, you know, CRMs, you know, truly understanding the cost of the media or the creative or what's actually driving your business and then truly thinking about lifetime value. No business, take away e-commerce, a restaurant, a farmer, somebody selling stones 200 years ago. If your whole business was only based on having somebody only shop with you once, you got a fucked up business. So sustainable strategies. So what Vayner Commerce does, if you're watching right now for the less than 1% that might consider working with Vayner Commerce, there's a consulting side where we literally look at your business, sit down for weeks, come up with better ideas, tell you how to do it, and then potentially either do it for you on the building out or doing stuff, or you take that and do it internally or you do it with somebody else. And then there's the building and tech side where we build things from you know day one, like you're ready to, you got, you're on some janky system that wanted to prove out the concept and you want to build on top of you know uh, a platform. And so that's, a, that, that's what it does. And so thinking and doing at the macro. So Robbie, first story. Yeah, so, um... A bit of background, I, I was at Shopify Plus um, 2016, 2017, started out on the enterprise side, then went into a team called New Markets. Um, and that, that role was interesting because it was the it was sort of the peak of, or the beginning of the peak of, you know, the D2C marketing playbook. A lot of venture capital came in, a lot of brands got funded, uh, there was exits. And um, what was interesting was I sat in conversations with executives, with consultants, um, with investors, and everyone was saying basically the same thing. Everyone had the same strategies. They had the same tech stack. They had the same approaches. Um, and so it, it started to become obvious that um, everything was going to be commoditized out, right? That arbitrage that existed in early 2010s was going to go away. And as, as brands started scaling on the platform on Shopify Plus, um, you know, to me, I didn't see who they had to turn to from a strategic growth perspective. And so that sort of led to... Um, the, the idea that uh, there'd be an opportunity for a new type of firm um, in, in the e-commerce space, um, but was important and sort of tying back to what Zubin was talking about was all the previous firms and the firms that exist today sort of focus on one area, right? They might focus on creative or they might focus on technology. With Vayner, they, they do creative and media. 
but no one was sort of understanding the full business, nor were they getting exposure to all of those problems. Uh, and, and so the the idea was if you could actually build a firm that understand complete holistic growth uh, and had exposure to all those areas and had top talent in each of those areas, you could start actually um, you know growing the businesses in uh, much more sustainable ways and effective ways. And what led me to the meeting with you, Gary, was uh, I thought you were probably, obviously VaynerMedia had scale, but you're also the only crazy enough CEO that could pull off um, operating all those different functions and, and bringing them together um, and changing the culture around creating sustainable growth. And so uh, obviously we had a mutual connection in Alex D. Simone. Um, How'd you and know Alex? I tried to book you as a speaker in Amsterdam like two years earlier through Alex. Um, and uh, he tried to sell me too many Gary books, so it didn't actually happen. Yep. But um, so he sounds he like that- you were under, sounds like you were trying to steal me on some arbitrage shit that we didn't appreciate <laughs> on our side. Yes. yes yeah. Keep, so, you know. so um, you know, we we essentially got that ten minute meeting in New York in <laughs> your that, office. Say that one more time for the kids in the back. Ten minute meeting. So uh, let's let's shoot straight here because we've never had this talk. Let's make this entertaining or at least interesting or insightful or bring value in different ways. When you see that the meeting is ten minutes, do you think I'm a dick face? Do you think <laughs> I'm efficient? Do you think like oh, do you, did you start knowing you a little bit? Did you start thinking about strategy? Like how you did you think that you were gonna schmooze your way into 30 like how did you think about that um so when i when i saw the 10 alex obviously set the expectations that it was going to only be 10 minutes but i had kind of already known your persona and we're both fast talkers so i actually felt pretty pretty Confident. good about it yeah um and and you know going into the actual meeting um you know i basically articulated a lot of what i just said uh, and gave the context on you know basically i thought the market was heading to a, to a place that wasn't good and no one else was going to you know, solve it. Um, and and I think what was became obvious very early on was you've been thinking about ecom probably for the past 10 years. And so you finished a lot of the sentences. And I think it was around minute four um, that you kind of just hired me. Uh, and then, <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then it escalated uh, to you sort of talking about the empire building and, and all of that. And that was, that was the 10 minutes. And then that was that. Yeah, and I remember like was our second meeting while I was filming like Planet of the Apps or 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 Spanish. yeah, in Los Angeles. Yeah, like I met you and like like we literally had a meeting. In the CBC park- parking lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> CBS, you're not in Canada. Anymore, CBS. Yeah. Um, okay, so Zubin, pick up this story. So Robbie and I start jamming. So Robbie then- calls me. I'm- <laughs> Yeah. Good, good so job. I'm in, I'm actually in San Francisco. I remember it's like September 17, 18, 2017. He calls me and I'm on my way to a friend's wedding. He calls me and says, Hey, um, and we'd met because we did a number of deals together at Shopify Plus, most notably the hundreds. We worked on that together. Um, and so Robbie, Ben, and I had met in Waterloo, Canada months before that. Um, ben and I did a uh, lunch and learn with the Shopify team to explain like how we leveraged their technology, extended it, all the stuff, content and commerce. Um, had a great time over there in Waterloo, met Robbie, and uh, Robbie says to me, we're going to the airport the next day. Robbie says to me uh, the night before, can, you get, can I get a ride with you to Toronto? And I said, sure. Now find out years later, as you mentioned, Robbie being strategic, he actually planned that entire conversation to tell me that he didn't have a ride so he could ride with me and we could chat. So we start chatting, have a great conversation on commerce, tech, all this stuff. Uh, we miss our exit. That was not planned. And we missed our exit. It took us another 40 minutes to reroute. And in that 40 minutes, we bonded. And that's when we realized, okay, shit, there's something special here. What are we going to do about it? So come September of that year, he tells me he's going to go meet with you and says, look, uh, I'm I'm thinking about different things. And I'm going to go talk to Gary Vaynerchuk. Do you know who Gary Vaynerchuk is? And I said, yeah, I know of him. I know of him. Um, He said, I want to see what opportunities there are in New York and whatnot. And I said, look, if it doesn't work out with Gary, you call me. You're an amazing salesperson. I'll hire you. So he calls me um, a week later and says, I had a great meeting with Gary. Gary's going to come to LA uh, in December and he wants to meet you for breakfast. And I said, brilliant. I'd love to meet Gary. Um, And he said, Gary usually takes 10, 15 minute meetings. You're going to get an hour with him for breakfast, which is like the opposite side of the anxiety scale of 10 minutes, filling 10 minutes of time is easy. Filling an hour of time with Gary, like, fuck are we going to do this? Um, But we hit it off and we hit it off on a human level. I think it was really important for me to understand kind of what you do, what VaynerMedia does. For a lot of people that don't understand what you do at VaynerMedia or what the company does, VaynerX, 
they don't know the full extent of your organization and you, frankly. Um, and so having that conversation and aligning on so many different like, personal professionals. Real professional, shit because this yeah. is actually something that I think a lot about. Yeah. Was it in that meeting you're like, oh, this guy's not a mascot, he's an operator? Yes. That makes sense. And it was, I mean, I, and I it was, and it was, go ahead. It, it was beyond an operator, right? It's like, to Robbie's point, I think you meet different people, interact with different people. There are people that position themselves as one thing or another and they don't have that depth. And you have that conversation. And then, again, in like 10, 15 minutes, I'm like, oh man, I really like this guy. He actually gets it. And it's not just talk. And then I think you mentioned something <clears throat> like that to me. And then we realized like there's a lot of alignment there. And, and again, uh, people don't understand the magnitude of the organization of <clears throat> businesses that you've built, right? Many of the people that are listening right now. And, and that became abundantly clear to me in like 15, 20 minutes. So I'm I, like, okay, this is awesome. How are we gonna like work together? I wanna add some context to that too. So I called him coming. So you went, Gary, in that 10 minute meeting to like empire building. And it was actually when I was leaving that meeting that I, I was like, shit, what am I gonna do? Um, you know, I, I need to go build this guy a big business now based on that last 10 minutes. <laughs> and so, uh, and as much as I love Zubin on a human level and we did connect, I also realized that they were building something that Ben's going to talk about in just terms of how they approach technology and how we saw the market changing. And so my first call was to Zubin because I knew that they were building something that was going to be critical for you know what I thought was all brands uh, on the tech stack and how they were building technology in just a very different way on, on Shopify Plus. Um, and Ben, if you want to go into that um, a bit and just sort of talk about it, but that that's kind of like in real time what happened. Uh, and then and then I think I wrote you a note, Gary, saying, hey, we need to buy this business. And you responded and said, how much? <laughs> 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 and then uh, and then we coordinated the, the meeting. Ben, before we get into what you build on top, because I'm, I'm reading yeah. the comments, which is the advantage of this podcast that I don't normally have when I'm just doing a podcast, which may yeah. mean I never do a podcast in my office again and only do it this way. You know, Talk to me about the biggest mistake people make with building out their website. What is going on with, you know, we brought up Shopify a lot. Robbie comes from there. We're all advocates of it because, you know, the open source nature of it. There are obviously other players, Magento, Big Commerce, things of that nature. Like, what are you seeing? Like, you know, to, you know listen, obviously I want to do this podcast because I want people to be aware we're in the game. Uh, yeah. uh, to be frank, more than that, I want this for history. I can't wait to look back at this in 30 years and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But, but, more importantly, I always want all my content to bring value. So just shifting a little bit to value from a technologist's point of view, where, where are you seeing people struggle or make missteps, waste money on tech? A lot of people that are listening to this are just entrepreneurs who don't understand. You know, I had the great benefit of sitting literally side by side, when I'm talking shoulder to shoulder with Eric Kastner, my first CTO in 1998, and I learned a lot, Like, including, I mean, these are real crazy stories, like I remember the day he looked at me when I was looking up a wine on Yahoo and he said, go to Google. I'm like, what's this? And I remember, la this is a real story. I remember landing on google.com, complete white page. And I'm like, these guys are never gonna make money. There's no advertising. You know, like that. Like it was just so oh. such a fun time for me, but I learned through osmosis. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs that look like me didn't get lucky enough to sit next to a technologist practitioner every day for three years, 18 hours a day, which led to being more knowledgeable. Like. I think when I got into Web 2.0, everybody was stunned by my product knowledge or understanding, back to what you're bringing up, Zoom, the depth. You know, I think a lot of the entrepreneurs listening right now don't have the you in their life, so they usually want to outsource that to India or Poland, or they want to like cut corners, or they overpay. Let's bring some value, like who, what, what mistakes are you seeing from a tech standpoint with people that are getting into commerce today? It's a, a loaded question. Um, yeah, I mean, spitball, like you know, common. You don't need to. This is not about being right. This is about scenario <laughs> sharing that may help. You know, I'm obsessed with one person getting one piece of value that might have. Yeah. I think a lot of people are about to go into e-commerce, and somebody was about to spend thirteen thousand dollars on something they don't on thirteen thousand they don't have, and they may hear you say something that might send them down a different path. Yeah, well, I think the big the big thing right now is there's a lot of um, there's a lot of discussion discussion about like which e-commerce platform is the right platform, right? I mean, you mentioned, yeah, yeah, there's Magento and big commerce. And obviously um, we tend to lean towards Shopify and more specifically Shopify plus, um, but there's all kinds of options out there. And it's not necessarily that one platform is the best at everything. Yeah, um, right. we, we like Shopify because it's very flexible in the sense of it's kind of just, um, 
Is it the, and this I actually don't know this, is it the best price entry or are there other alternatives? I know, I know um, Squarespace is starting to play, like again, I'm trying to really bring value to the audience. Is there, do you feel like it's the most practical? Like I was thinking about WordPress and what that meant to content. And I think about the e-commerce platforms of today, you know, uh, I'm curious what your perspective is for the person that's really trying to start a $50,000 a year e-commerce site. Where do they go? Do yeah, they even get well, a platform? It depends, right? I mean, it, if if the core of your business is e-commerce, and this is actually kind of the general problem in the industry right now, but if e-commerce is the focus, then Shopify makes a lot of sense. If content is your focus, then maybe something like, again, if you're starting small, something like Squarespace might make more sense, right? So do you, do you use a content platform and then sprinkle some e-commerce on top? Or do you start with a content or an e-commerce platform and try to build content around it? Has um, WordPress, Ben, I'm sorry to interrupt, and this is out of curiosity, yeah. I literally don't know this. Has WordPress started creating WordPress plugins that help for commerce? Yeah, so like WooCommerce is probably the most popular mm, yeah, of those. Yep, yep, um, yep, yep. I'm sure you've heard of those. Yeah, and I have. I think a lot of people don't even think of them as WordPress, but yeah, WooCommerce right. is, is yep, yep. the WordPress equivalent. Yep. Um, so same idea, but it's it's always it's always this um, compromise. It's do you care about content or do you care about e-commerce? And one or the other is going to kind of fall by the wayside, Makes sense. right? And so it's definitely, I don't want to say that it's a, a big shortcoming of Shopify, but just any e-commerce platform in general, it could be Magento or big commerce, whatever, like they're not great for content. So that gap that we're trying to really fill right now is a no compromises solution where you can make your content and have proper e-commerce in one platform. So that's- A couple people have um, asked, what's the difference between Shopify and Shopify Plus? I've seen like 10 questions of that. Uh, well, the- the short answer is price, but no, there's a lot more to it. Uh, but I mean, Shopify Plus starts at like two thousand a month, um, as opposed to like a, I think core Shopify they brought it down. To, I think it's nine dollars a month now for the starter starter plan. So yep. they're 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 aimed at very very different businesses. Um, Shopify Plus probably doesn't make sense unless you're doing like ten million in revenue or so. so. What about um, maybe, even, maybe maybe just I mean, if you need the features. I'm trying to think uh, about two thousand a month. You know, starting point like that's you know. That's only forty eight thousand dollars. I think for your tech stack, you know, even if you're even if you're a three million dollar, it really depends on your profit, right? And if you're raising Correct. capital, but like if you're running a three million dollar business, kicking eight hundred thousand dollars, you know, you know, like what are your expenses? Like it's, it really gets interesting right. on like where that justifies. But nonetheless, respect. You could be selling something that's super high margin, and it makes sense at a million dollars, right? But it it really it comes down to um, for a lot of people, it's feature. So there's certain there's certain features that are only available on Plus. Again, they're usually more targeted at larger businesses like um, custom gift card functionality or the ability to do really customized discounts and kind of marketing things around around that. Um, but if you don't need any of the Plus specific features, you can kind of get away with Core for Understood. for a while and kind of grow into it, which is I think Shopify's plan is to you know start your small business with us and then they grow with you. And now they're even sense. doing fulfillment, which is crazy awesome. One thing I want to mention, uh, so Ben's talking about like the tech side of it, just some advice that everybody out there was starting e-com or getting into it or any business, frankly, right? Um, but I think the, the thing is people tend to lean away from what they're good at um, or they don't value it as much, right? So, uh, and it, it has to do with uh, people, brands of all sizes. Like they're, they're good at something, they don't really value it, and then they end up um, trying to do something completely different. Point I'm trying to make here is like with the entrepreneurs out there that are trying to start e-commerce, you're good at something. There's a reason why you want to do something, right? And lean into that. You look at a brand like the Hundreds. That's a client of ours. Like they're they built streetwear culture. They're part of streetwear culture. You look at their products. You look at the site. You look at the in-store experience. It's all unified, and they leaned into that. So my point with this is like, find out why you're starting this thing. What matters to you? Lean into that and double down on that, and try to stay core to that. Because the Ben's earlier point about content and and all this stuff. That content or whatever you're putting out is only going to resonate with people if it matters to you and you're doing it for a purpose. So on a non-technical level, that's what I would suggest. There's, Bobby, yeah, yeah the, please go ahead. So um, focusing more on as you're, as you're scaling, right? So <clears throat> the, the market in terms of consumer behavior is heavily being driven by, by Amazon. Um, and if, if you want to think about essentially what Shopify is doing is they call it arming the rebels, right? They're, you know, Amazon has all these resources to invest into things like logistics and fulfillment, right? Amazon Prime, you know, all these different um, capabilities. And so they, they win on price, they win on assortment, they win on convenience. Um, and if you're a brand and you only have a finite amount of resources, 
you can't afford to keep up with all that innovation because you just don't have that 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 pool of money to to invest. Shopify does have the resources for innovation, and not only do they have the resources, they're incredibly consistent, uh, and they have a focus on that as an organization to ha allow merchants to keep up um, with Amazon. This is super important in my perspective on what platform you choose. The reason is right now it may not look as obvious of how much Amazon's driving consumer behavior, but in, if we want to fast, for, fast forward 12 months, two years, three, four, five years, and you're not keeping up with innovation on things like payments, right, or fulfillment, um, you know, simple checkouts, then you're going to be allocating all your resources to have to build that yourself if your platform you're out, you're you're aligning yourself with isn't doing that. Yeah, and I mean, so, th th I mean, for everybody who's watching, this happened with media, with social media. This happened with publishing, with WordPress and Squarespace and all the others. Like, the, the, it's super, like, like it's super important to not only make the right decision, but I want to make sure people aren't crippled by if you made a decision, if you're not locked, you know, as long as you're not too, too locked in, you can always pull the bandaid off. Nobody likes changing their tech stack. That's why SaaS businesses do well. You end up sitting with that business for an extra year or two then because you're just so painful to migrate. Um, but at the small scale, which a lot of people are listening are right now, you're not going to get crushed by making the wrong decision. But to Robbie's point, making the right long-term decision that has an impact on your business. Yeah, now I, I, wanna, I wanna tie it full, full circle to you know, why, why we acquired Lucid Fusion. So at the same time that Shopify is incredibly good at democratizing the tech and enabling you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, um, they also at the same time eliminate barriers to entry that previously existed, right? So in the 2010s, if you could have a site that could stay up on Black Friday, Cyber Monday, that was a value add to the customer, right? You would get that customer's business and they would come back because they know that you could withstand all the different traffic. Now everyone has a site that works extremely well. And so what happens is these barriers to entry that previously existed have gone away. And this is just as true on the acquisition side with things like Facebook and, and Google ads. And so what happens is, well, as you have more competition fueled by venture capital, um, you know, flooding the market, it gets harder and harder to do what these brands want to do, which is build a sustainable direct consumer business. And so what, what do you do? Essentially, the, the answer is you have to start building unique IP. You need to start building unique value creation and value propositions for your clients. That's actually difficult for others to copy. And if you're just using Shopify's ecosystem of apps and, and tech um, solutions as they give it to you, then you have the same tech stack as all these other millions of brands that have no barriers to entry to copy exactly what you're doing. And so what we would basically the, the bet we were making was, you know, even some of the biggest brands on Shopify for them to scale stack, and they're going to need to leverage um, what Shopify has the best in the market, which is APIs, right, and build custom solutions and content and commerce on, on top. And when, you know, coming from Shopify Plus, when I looked at the agency ecosystem, no one was doing that. They're all building within themes and they're all leveraging Shopify's tools versus building custom technology themselves. And so the, the critical component to, to Zubin and Ben and what they're building was this ability to leverage the, you know, the, all of Shopify's investments into innovation while still being able to build unique IP around content, commerce, and other experiences. Zubin, as coming from the tech stack side, let's mm -hmm. actually come from a different angle. When you and Ben and your amazing team have done its best work, tech's right, it's right. Um, what have you seen the common themes? Because again, I'm trying to bring a lot of value to the listeners. For sure. What has been the common theme of you seeing people not be as successful at e-commerce um, as, they, as they thought or as you thought they should? Because you've created, you know, in essence, the tech stack is almost like, like the restaurant operating well. But then exactly. you also have to get the restaurant people there. You have to do something like what what's been what's been the misstep by entrepreneurs, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, and big businesses in your mind? So I think that the common with, ones. Yeah, yeah. So with uh, with a lot of the companies, the, the smaller organizations, you can build them the best tech. They could even have really strong media coming in, but then they hit all sorts of like uh, logistical issues, supply chain issues, et cetera. That's on that side of it, right? from a standpoint. And so it's really important to get all those ducks in a row. The other side of it from a tech standpoint is not really knowing what to do with what we give them. So even if we do everything great, if they don't have the right expertise in house, um, cause at the end of the day, like people hire agencies all the time, organizations hire agencies, but you have to have some expertise in house. 
And so whether it's a small organization or a large one. So too much outsourcing. Um, like the same way I talk about social media, which exactly. is like, if you don't know how to judge the work, yeah. you're always going to be vulnerable. Yeah. And you've got to have some level of expertise in house, right? Like you're, I think the, the problem is that Robbie's earlier point about barrier of entry. The barrier to entry is lowered so much for DTC brands that anybody thinks they can just open anything and start selling online, but they don't realize that there's a lot to that business beyond just spinning up a store and selling the product. And I think that's becoming abundantly clear, especially now with so much demand for e-commerce, right? Like we're all seeing it. We're all ordering online things we would have never ordered. And then people that we know in our lives that never ordered online are all of a sudden ordering things. And they're realizing the organizations, the companies, the brands, et cetera, that shit, this isn't just a channel for us. This could be the channel that powers no, everything, is, including no, retail. The business. Exactly. This is the bit, and that's really what it is. You it know, is I'm, go, a I'm a maniac right now on winetechs.com signups because yeah. it's becoming the business. The service is so right. The friction is so amazing. Lack of friction, so insane. People, the people are just enjoying the service. And all of a sudden it becomes like when I when I launched Wine Text for my dad when I came up with the idea and they built it, when I when I did Wine Library, I never thought of it as an add-on to the liquor store. I always thought the liquor store was gonna be the add-on to that business. And I think I think that's the crossroads a lot of people are gonna come to to that conclusion in a post-COVID consumer world. Totally. Ben, and, and the fact Ben, as somebody no. who's, uh, apologize for zooming, get Ben in here for a second. Ben, uh, by the way, everybody who's asking questions on the stream, Ben was on mute because he's a considerate man and he knows that he's in a windy area, so he didn't want yeah. any feedback. Sorry, he understands Mike. how technology works. <laughs> so Ben, um, you know, what, what, I was curious because you've been in the game so long. Like I think back to the biggest miss of my career. I was doing, I figured out very early on in like 1997 that I saw the data on the carts that weren't completed and I started contacting people through whatever information I had, and I was doing open cart optimization, and literally, it was like a good year or 18 months from then that I even like saw that hit the ecosystem. I, was, I don't think I invented it. I don't know what other people were doing, but it's always fun to think back to those early days of like what I saw that then becomes common practice. From a tech standpoint, what are you seeing right now that few people are doing that you think is gonna become, of course, in a decade? just trying to bring value to the listeners. Anything stand out right now? Yeah, well, I, I guess it depends on the audience, right? I mean, there's there's so much stuff for me. It's like right now everybody wants to talk about retail and e-commerce and then you've got buzzwords like omni-channel and whatever. Everything's a channel, right? But really, it's just it's all just commerce. Yeah, and we just need to sell, get away it's all just We need to shit, get man. away from that we're just trying to about, sell shit. Uh, right. And, like I want to do you know, events it, and sell shit, not just the, like, you're always selling. Always be selling, Ben. It, well, exactly. And it's one of these things where, you know, we were probably five ish years away from this. And now we're more like it's literally right now because of COVID-19. Um, you know, I wish the motivation to get all this stuff done now was for a different reason. But, um, but you know, that line is so blurry now. Right. If you order some products from Walmart and, in their app and then you drive to the store and they put them in your trunk, was that e-commerce or was that retail? It was neither. Right. It's oh, just commerce. COVID, I don't care what you call it. COVID may actually save Target and other retailers because I think Walmart's big enough to like succeed. But like, there's a, when I think of like, like, like uh, mid tier like department stores, five below, and all this. Uh, like, I actually think the curbside is going to give them a chance with same day delivery, mm -hmm. like in a way that really is going to be meaningful. Exactly. Do you, do you predict? And this is just a guess because it's too early. Do you think curbside is now a standard? for retailers in 36 months? I think so. I'd be very disappointed if when this all blows over, that went away. I, I mean, I think people will get very used to that convenience. It's just a better experience, right? It, it doesn't need to be about, you know, oh, it's touchless obviously right now because, you know, we want to be social distancing, but it's still a way better experience. And then you can, I think the more important part is you can turn all these retail stores into more of an experiential, you know, shopping place, right? It's, it's more like the Ikea model or something like that, where you go in ben, and you can I apologize try the for interrupting. Ben, I apologize for interrupting. I'm going on mute. People are mad that I'm interrupting and they asked if I can go on mute. So I'm going on mute. Rob, you <laughs> take over. I'm going to take a three minute break with my excitement. Go ahead. You can keep going, Ben. Uh, no, I'm just saying, you know, it, it would be great if, um, uh, and we actually had a conversation about this the other day, but you know, if you, if you walk into, you know, Best Buy or something and you're going there to try out the products and, and then, 
when you, you pick out the one that you like and it's waiting for you at the register and you, they just pop it in your car, that's a much better experience than going into a store that right now is basically just aisles and aisles of boxes, right? I mean, it's not, it's not an experience right now. In the same way on the e-commerce side, um, you know, and then we talk about content and commerce, um, the content's so important because if you're just showing a boring catalog of stuff, you're trying to compete directly with Amazon. Like they've got that game down, right? You're not gonna win the, I just wanna look at a bunch of stuff. But if you're actually telling a story and you're connecting with your audience, right? That That's something that, that Amazon can't compete with, right? They're, that's not their, their goal. So, um, you know, again, I think you're gonna see that experience change online and, and in store. And I think it's, I think it's, Go ahead, Subin. Go ahead, Robbie. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that it's an interesting, um, uh, it's related also to driving sustainable growth in the dot com. I think there's been a lot of assumptions made around what the value is of, of D2C. Um, you know, and and um, we, we, you know, we've seen this in terms of if you just look at where, you know, the majority of brands allocate resources on a D2C operation, they allocate it to the acquisition, they sell the product. And then there's, you know, that, that's that's the majority of their their resource allocation, and they think the value creation for the customer is in the product alone. Um, and then, you know, if you're in food and bev, you you don't see even the value in D 2 C because you can get that on, on Amazon. Um, what we've proven, what we figured out was that that's just that's just sort of a broken understanding. And it's built on a lot of sort of flawed of assumptions. There's tons of ways, whether it's you know delivery or SMS, like Gary's been able to break down with. with um, there's all these different areas to create value for your customer. And not only are brands, uh, not only should brands be aware of that, they actually have to shift towards that because everyone else has figured out the value creation on acquisition and, you know, having an easy, you know, having a, a PDP in a Shopify store. And so, um, we're, we're I think we're, um, we see a lot of problems with sustainability and loyalty and lifetime value is there's been no, um, no resources or time spent on on figuring out what is the actual value creation we want to deliver over the life cycle of a customer at every point, post purchase as well. Um, and, and and so I think there's a lot of connections there where people just have certain assumptions on how D 2 C works, what retail does, what Amazon does, um, and they've never even experimented um, uh, or understood really what their consumers were were looking for. I think there's a really important point for those of you at home uh, in terms of what Robbie's talking about, and then like. To kind of back to, as Gary was mentioning, translating what I said, to translate a little bit of what uh, Robbie just mentioned right now, um, what we've realized it, and that applies kind of to all brands starting at any size um, is that it's not about being right, right, every time. It's about realizing that right is not a binary concept. It's not yes or no. It's like you have these goals. You want to get to these goals. Um, it's not only when you cross that line where you're successful. And really what we've realized is that being almost right most of the time is better than being precisely right occasionally. And so we apply that to everything we do as Robbie's talking about, and we were mentioning earlier, I was talking about like full funnel growth and whatnot. What it really means is that we try to find right for our clients as you should try to find right with everything you do and, and not be feel like you know what's right or that you know what's right, but you got to get into it and you got to test this stuff. And so whether it's tech, whether it's messaging, it's creative, it's media, everything you're doing, you've got to test the shit out of it in order to find out like what's the best thing for your brand, what's the best thing for you, and then ultimately for your consumers. What do they care about in terms of your brand? You're gonna talk about all these things about this uh, widget that you have and why it's so great, and then realize that the reason why they want it is because it's pink, and that's the only reason they want it. So fucking hold down on the fact that it's pink and build your entire narrative around that. So I think that just test and iterate as much as you can and that's where you'll really actually find like those unicorn opportunities to massively scale. And I, I think, one, go ahead, Ben. Go ahead. I was just gonna say one, one thing on that too. Uh, a, a word or buzzword that kind of irks me is best practices. Uh, they're important, right? No doubt, it's a great starting point, but that's literally all that it is. Like best practices are where you can maybe get an idea of where to start testing, but this idea that I don't need to test because I'm following all the best practices. I'm like, Amazon already figured this out for me, total bullshit, right? It might work for Amazon. It doesn't mean that it's going to work for you. So really that that testing and, and using a tech stack that allows you to easily test is kind of one of the most important things that you can do. <clears throat> yeah, and um, 
Gary, you asked at the beginning, you know, how to describe Vayner Commerce. I, I think this sets up maybe the most important point, which is we're talking about all these things and the observation we've had is no one's built the right infrastructure for it, right? So we, we've, we've built the infrastructure of all these D2C brands or modern day brands around acquisition. We've built cultures around it. Um, we built measure, measurement systems around it. And, and so, you know, to create um, a system, to, 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 to operate at a, at a level of experimentation across the full funnel requires um, not having constraints, right? So some of those constraints are technology. Some of them are how you actually or, or, you know, organize your, your, your people. Part of it is your measurement systems. And I would say even you know, the most sophisticated brands we've come across, the ones that get the praise in the headlines, aren't structured in a way to take advantage of all the things that, that we're talking about. And so the infrastructure is broken and uh, it was built on the back of where value was created in the 2010s, right? Which was the gold rush of paid media. That now that the value creation, you know, where value is created now has shifted, it's a moving target. Um, these infrastructures haven't adapted and they're not built to, to now capture it. And so I think the good news for the audience, whether you're a Fortune 100 executive, whether you're an entrepreneur, or you know, you know, whether you're already one of these brands, is it's a level playing field. I, I don't think the Fortune 100s are behind. I don't think the D2C brands, you know, are, are behind because they're running out of media. Everyone's starting in the same, you know, they're starting at the same race because it's it's a new game that requires a new way of thinking about growth. And and no one, from our observation, and we've talked to hundreds of brands, have have built the infrastructure to be able to do it. All right, that was about as difficult of a task <laughs> as I've ever had in my entire life. Um, and there was really good stuff coming out, but unfortunately, I almost died. All right, so let's wrap this up because I gotta get to my next meeting, pretty much. Um, I'm really excited. I hope the audience uh, got some value out of that. I really tried to steer the conversation into, you know, it's always tough when we, when we launch a new company. We did it with Sasha, we did it with other things. We've been excited. Me and Rob have been sitting on this for two plus years, going back to Sabir and some of the great people on our team, Angela and Axel and others. We've been sitting on this for a very, very long time. You know, obviously we did some commerce capabilities inside of Vayner Media as a division, but to be a standalone company, to have VaynerCommerce.com, please everybody who's listening right now, if you have any commerce needs or anybody that you know does, uh, please go check out VaynerCommerce.com, fill out the forms. I think the team did an incredible job. I would argue it's probably the best Vayner X company's website at this point um, on its initial launch, so good job on that team. Um, I, think, uh, I, think there's a, I think there's a lot of opportunity in this space Forget about Vayner Commerce and what we're bringing to the table. I think anybody who's listening, if you do not realize how much opportunity there is to sell stuff on the internet and how early we are, whether you know whether you believe the reports or I think Zub and Ben keep me honest here, Robbie, 14, 15% of all commerce now is e-commerce, you know, was 12 forever. It's, it's, I think we all probably agree that we'll see a bigger spike and probably have zoomed up two, three, four years in advance because of COVID. The opportunity for so many entrepreneurs, and more importantly, if you're a big company, if you own a store, if, you, if you're listening right now and you own a store, and your store or stores does five million a year in revenue, top line, if you are not seriously getting serious about launching an e-commerce, not the bullshit that you checked the box in 2002 and you have one, and it's a still garbage fucking static picture, like some dog shit. I mean like really, really getting focused about e-commerce during this time. Get yourself educated. Um, uh, check out things like 2PM, you know, my buddy Websmith, 2PML.com, like that's a good source. Robbie, what are the, I know that's a newsletter that we respect. Is there any other sources? I mean, there's Google, you can look up shit. Is there any other source? I know we're planning on putting out a good amount of content. I just really want to help this community get serious about it. Any other things stand out to you, Robbie, from a content standpoint? I know you follow all this shit. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think I think two PM is good. I think um, we're gonna work to fill a, a void that that's there, um, and then you know I think we could probably put together a Twitter list of, of people to follow and, and different things. Yeah, why don't we? Why don't we? Why don't you do that? Why don't you on the Vayner? Is it at Vayner Commerce the Twitter handle? Everybody who's interested in this, go check out Vayner Commerce on Twitter. It's Vayner Commerce, one word, no spaces, all that. Vayner Commerce. Uh, Robbie, team, do me a favor. Put out, show a little love to the community that you guys grew up in. Put out some handles of people that people should know about um, as well. And so, uh, any last parting shots, Ben, Zubin, Robbie? 
no, this is great. Let's do it again. Thanks. Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Thank for everybody who's listening and watching, uh, I'm going to have a, a bunch of really interesting people on the podcast, uh, Coffee and Commerce, kind of little sub-brand that I'm going to play under, uh, hopefully five or six meaningful interviews over the next two weeks that you can learn from. Uh, this kind of launches it. You kind of become aware of the characters. I really appreciated the love that Ben Zubin and Robbie got in the comment section on the live streams. Uh, really very kind words. I hope you guys are able to go look back and see the nice yeah. words. I well, also thanks, appreciate guys. the uh, <laughs> the mute session I went through. It was a great moment in my life. <laughs> you know, something I hope I don't have to repeat. And, a uh, moment of silence. Yeah, it was tough. Uh, and thank you for everybody listening. I hope you have a wonderful day. I hope we've inspired some new thoughts or some hypotheses that you can double click into. Uh, have a great day. And uh, and Vayner Commerce is here. Big day. I would argue the company I probably should have started my world with, given that I had credibility in commerce in 2009 when I started Vayner Media. But we've gotten here eventually, and we're excited to do a bunch of good work. And if you need any help, please go to VaynerCommerce.com, fill out the forums, check us out. I think we're even hiring, Rami. I saw there was a section of that people like so. A lot of cool stuff there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Zubin, Ben, Robbie. Talk to you soon. Bye, bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye, guys. See. You.